In the last video, we have seen how Deleuze makes being univocal by making modes and attributes absolutely equal. The being of modes, that is, creatures, is equal to the being of attributes which are abstractions like time, space or goodness. By way of consequence, being is understood as a pure multiplicity. This theoretical background was set by Deleuze in order to discuss repetition, which is the topic of this new chapter. So far, we know that difference or multiplicity is the in itself of the eternal return, and repetition, as the title of the present chapter shows, is the for itself, which alludes to lived experience, that is, experience in time. So in this chapter, Deleuze is going to tell a fantastic story, the story of time, which comes in three acts, or, as he says, three syntheses. A synthesis, simply put, happens when you regroup different moments that seem completely separated into one, like for example the image that best summarizes your last vacation at the beach. But there are different ways to synthesize time that are very distinct. The images of memory are not the same as those that come out of imagination. Deleuze distinguishes three syntheses of time, three repetitions which are like levels of complexity. The constitution of repetition already implies three instances, the in itself which causes it to disappear as it appears, leaving it unthinkable, the for itself of the passive synthesis, and, grounded upon the latter, the reflected representation of a for us in the active synthesis. In order to understand this, let's consider the following point. If time was left to itself, then it would be composed of moments that are completely disconnected and simply follow each other blindly. Once something is passed, it's gone forever. A moment is undone as a new one is done. So for example, if I'm a dog, I may take a nap, and then I go play with other dogs, and then do something else in complete oblivion of what happened before. So the first synthesis will accomplish a very simple task. Reacting on the first level of the in itself, it regroups, or as Deleuze says, contracts, separate moments, into one. Imagine, for instance, that every time some event A occurs, even B always follows. When the bell rings, I always receive food. Very quickly, A and B will become one, and the ring of the bell will mean food. But how does this contraction happen? It's important to not presuppose anything like mind or subjectivity, or even intelligence, to explain it. All we have so far is time. So Deleuze presents this case as follows. When A appears, we expect B with a force corresponding to the qualitative impression of all contracted ABs. This is by no means a memory, nor indeed an operation of the understanding. Contraction is not a matter of reflection. Properly speaking, it forms a synthesis of time. This synthesis contracts the successive independent instance into one another, thereby constituting the lived or living present. Out of this contraction comes the first, most basic level of our conscious experience, the living present, to which past and future are subordinated. The future event B is subordinated to A, and when B becomes the new present, A is already gone. This is to say that the arrow of time appears. Deleuze insists that this first synthesis is not a psychological phenomenon, it is rather fundamental to all beings. He deploys a beautiful cosmological lexicon to describe this first step. In the order of constituent passivity, perceptual syntheses refer back to organic syntheses which are like the sensibility of the senses. They refer back to a primary sensibility that we are. We are made of contracted water, earth, light and air. Not merely prior to the recognition or representation of these, but prior to their being sensed. The first synthesis is said to be passive because it does not occur in the mind, but rather it is what makes the mind possible. The contraction of time defines the realm of habits, which are the basis of our entire psychological life. And so it is at this level that the self appears as a product of contemplation. We must always first contemplate something else, the water or Diana or the woods, in order to be filled with an image of ourselves. All of this prepares the next level. The contraction of time in the first synthesis was about imagination. When distinct cases are regrouped into one and form a habit, imagination is at play. Dogs have a lot of imagination, but now a second synthesis appears, which is more complex. What it does is to take elements that were contracted in the first synthesis and recreates the past as an abstraction. This is the formation of memory. On the basis of the qualitative impression in the imagination, memory reconstitutes the particular cases the contracted ABs, as distinct, conserving them in its own temporal space. 
This new synthesis is grounded in the past. While in the first synthesis the living present was central, now it is the past in its pure form which takes the lead. From the point of view of the reproduction involved in memory, it is the past understood as the mediation of presence, which becomes general, while the present as well as former present becomes particular. The synthesis of memory is said to ground the passive synthesis of imagination or habit. Let us note the terminology that Deleuze uses here. At the level of habits, time is founded, meaning that this is where concrete experience begins. At the level of memory, time is grounded, meaning that the present grounds itself in the past, which is then defined as the condition of the present. In this second synthesis, the ancient present is reproduced or represented in the current present, which introduces something like a step between the thing and the image of the thing. In other words, the present is not an immediate presentation anymore, it becomes a representation. Now the former present cannot be represented in the present one without the present one itself being represented in that representation. It is of the essence of representation not only to represent something but to represent its own representativity. It's pretty clear that the representation of the past occurs in the mind, so it is an active synthesis. But grounding is passive, it occurs automatically. One question we want to ask is, is the second synthesis passive or active? This is a problem because the passive synthesis of habits, the first level, cannot be grounded in an active synthesis. So the list is this. At the moment when it grounds itself upon habit, memory must be grounded by another passive synthesis distinct from that of habit. The passive synthesis of habit in turn refers to this more profound passive synthesis of memory. Habitus and Nimazaini, the alliance of the sky and the ground. But on the other hand, representing past moments in the present requires an activity of the mind, so the second synthesis appears also to be active. Here is what Deleuze says. Far from being derived from the present or from representation, the past is presupposed by every representation. In this sense, the active synthesis of memory may well be founded upon the empirical passive synthesis of habit, but on the other hand, it can be grounded only by another transcendental passive synthesis, which is peculiar to memory itself. Just to clarify, the word transcendental refers back to Kant. It means that now, in the second synthesis, we can not only experience the present, but we can represent its conditions. We can understand what our experience is conditioned by, namely space and time. Representation appears as the experience of the present becomes the understanding of these conditions. The second synthesis has to be both passive to the extent that it grounds the synthesis of habits and active to the extent that it represents the past. But how does memory effectuate the passage from passivity to activity? The answer in a nutshell is that the space of the pure past forms a self-contained totality, similar to Hegel's whole that we have seen last time, such that now subjectivity contains its condition. In a word, it can change itself. Here Deleuze distinguishes between two repetitions, one which he calls material, the other spiritual. Between the two repetitions, the material and the spiritual, there is a vast difference. The former is a repetition of successive independent elements or instants. The latter is a repetition of the whole on diverse coexisting levels. Difference is drawn from one insofar as the elements or instants are contracted within a living present, namely the contemplation which forms habits. It is included in the other insofar as the whole includes the difference between its levels. So the spiritual repetition is really about the subject, which appears when pure past provides the ability to aim at former presence and regroup them in the totality of an individual history. These two repetitions are complementary. One is bare, the other clothed. One is repetition of parts, the other of the whole. One involves succession, the other coexistence. One is actual, the other virtual. One is horizontal, the other vertical. But this creates a whole new problem. We have seen last time that any form of categorical thought, that is a thought which raises certain abstractions like space and time or the whole as conditions of experience, inevitably leads to a situation in which being becomes equivocal and can only be said by analogy, that is by reference to an ideal being, the world of essences, which is set to condition experience when in fact it is constructed by it or appears in it. This puts us in a dead end, it seems, and a new strategy is required. So at this point in the text, Deleuze needs to make the symptomatology of this situation. We don't know how he's going to solve the issue and escape the dead end, but we have one strong suspicion. 
The solution will come from the last faculty that has not yet been addressed, namely the intellect, which alone has the power to let us understand the nature of this pure past. The list presents the pure past as a noumenon, a thing in itself, most desirable for the mind but unattainable as such. He says this, The entire past is conserved in itself, but how can we save it for ourselves? How can we penetrate that in itself without reducing it to the former present that it was, or to the present in relation to which it is past? How can we save it for ourselves? It is more or less at this point that Proust intervenes, taking up the baton from Bergson. As soon as the in itself of the pure past appears, it becomes irresistible for the mind. We really want to understand what it is. One solution Deleuze explains is through reminiscence. This is Proust's famous example of the Madeleine, which makes him reminisce about Combray, the town of his youth. But Combray does not of course reappear as it was, and far from giving us a true repetition, it splits the present in two. Combray reappears not as it was or as it could be, but in a splendor which was never lived, like a pure past which finally reveals its double irreducibility to the two presents which it telescopes together, the present that it was, but also the present present which it could be. The new mental space that is being formed at the end of the second synthesis is a kind of vibration or echo between these two presents. As Deleuze says, the echo of the two presents forms only a persistent question which unfolds within representation like a field of problems, with the rigorous imperative to search, to respond, to resolve. In other words, reminiscence is the point where we ask ourselves what is the in itself of our past? This is how memory puts the mind in motion, as it were, which Deleuze expresses in mythological terms. It is always Eros, the noumenon, who allows us to penetrate this pure past in itself, this virginal repetition which is Nimozaini. This is quite important because it means that time now takes a new figure. The echo or back and forth produced in reminiscence means that time becomes circular. Difference is internalized, as Deleuze says. But this leads to a major issue, which is also a motif that we have encountered many times now. As time becomes circular, the eye is split. Indeed, if the arrow of time turns on itself, it's impossible for the self to decide if it is a cause or an effect, mind or matter. The spontaneity of which I am conscious in the I think cannot be understood as the attribute of a substantial or spontaneous being, but only as the affection of a passive self which experiences its own thought, its own intelligence, that by virtue of which it can say I, being exercised in it and upon it, but not by it. Here begins a long and inexhaustible story. I is another, or the paradox of inner sense. So we appear again to be in a massive impasse, and it feels like the subject, the conscience that lives in this space, is bound to a terrible fate, to be split just after it realizes its own condition. This is a difficult situation, but it has one advantage. It makes very clear the task of the third synthesis, namely to denounce the in itself which made time circular as an illusion. It's just a correlate of representation, an optical effect from which we must escape. The second synthesis culminates, as we have seen, in a circular form of time in which the self is alienated. Our task now is to undo this circle. As Deleuze says in a quote by Shakespeare that he likes a lot, time will now have to be out of joint. Time out of joint means dement time, or time outside the curve which gave it to God, liberated from its overly simple circular figure, freed from the events which made up its content, its relation to movement, overturned. In short, time presenting itself as an empty and pure form. Time now acquires a determination which Deleuze calls a symbol, which repairs the split eye and makes time an ensemble and a collection of series. Such a symbol adequate to the totality of time may be expressed in many ways, to throw time out of joint, to make the sun explode, to throw oneself into the volcano, to kill God or the Father. This symbolic image constitutes the totality of time to the extent that it draws together the caesura, the split eye, the before and the after. However, insofar as it carries out their distribution within inequality, it creates the possibility of a temporal series. So what Deleuze is saying here is that in the third synthesis, the aspect of time which becomes central is the future. At this point, I have forgotten the pure past, and I'm getting ready for action. As Deleuze explains, we see then that in this final synthesis of time, the present and future are in turn no more than dimensions of the future. 
The past has condition, the present has agent. It is here that finality occurs, that is, I become able to act towards a goal. But the emphasis for Deleuze is not on finality itself, but rather on the action that it implies. So Deleuze describes the three moments of action. First, something seems too big for me. Then, some change or metamorphosis occurs, the action itself in the present. And finally, an impersonal creation is produced. This does not mean, of course, that individuality disappears, but rather that it is renewed and takes a new form. This is Nietzsche's overman, who materializes, in fact, as a modest plebeian. In this manner, the I which is fractured according to the order of time and the self which is divided according to the temporal series correspond and find a common descendant in the man without name, without family, without qualities, without self or I. The plebeian, guardian of a secret, the already over man whose scattered members gravitate around the sublime image. But what happens to the figure of time itself? This is the final act in the story of time, and Deleuze presents it as follows. This is how the story of time ends, by undoing its too well-centered natural or physical circle and forming a straight line which then, led by its own length, reconstitutes an eternally decentered circle. In this tortuous circle, a new type of sign appears, which allows to reach true repetition by focusing on action, and it is called the simulacrum. It is the symbol that we have encountered before, but a very special kind of symbol indeed, not one which is given in advance and forms my understanding of reality, as for the cosmologists or realists, nor one which expresses the totality of an absolute subject, as for the idealists but rather one which is about the future, about action. This is why, in the last chapter, the list said this, The simulacrum is the sign insofar as the sign interiorizes the conditions of its own repetition. Now we know what the conditions of its own repetition means. It means that the simulacrum is not based on resemblance. Rather, it seizes a disparity and, as Deleuze says, tells several stories at once. A simulacrum does not have a model, and because it's not the copy of a model or essence, Deleuze presents it as the point at which Platonism is overturned. This is quite interesting because now we have a new understanding of the overturning of Platonism, which, if you recall, is one of the central tasks of difference and repetition. Namely that Platonism is overturned by action, by putting things in movement, or, for the philosopher, by creating new concepts. But what does the self become in all of this? Deleuze spends quite a few pages in this chapter talking about Freud's notion of the unconscious. It's a long discussion, but the bottom line is this. The unconscious follows the three syntheses of time, and as such it's not conflictual, but rather it is the instance that asks questions. It is eros, or the desire we have to explore the in itself of the pure past. If it contains symbols, it is only in the form of simulacra, meaning that which prompts us to question things, the phantasm which moves our interest towards the world. It is not a reservoir of past traumas, as Freud and others believed, but it is rather the movement by which we desire forward. It is a function of the future. In this sense, it could be said that the unconscious is the tipping point of conscience, rather than its substance. I hope you found this chapter as interesting as I did. It certainly is not an easy text, but hopefully this summary will help you navigate through it more easily. In the next chapter, we will see how Deleuze summarizes his findings so far by formulating eight postulates against representation. For now, thank you for watching, and see you soon.